morning, we were going to do something a little different today as we go through uh, a different passage, as we take a, a little break from um, our First Corinthians series. Today, as everyone is kind of, summer is ending as we're going back to school and back to um, the school year, and I just wanted for us, as we often seek so many blessings from um, the, from God for the new year. I wanted to spend a little time this morning in Proverbs chapter 3. And it does give us a, a list of um, things we ought to do and the, and the law of life are the results of that. So it's kind of, um, Proverbs is written in a way where there are these things. If you do A, usually B happens. Uh, there are these wise sayings that uh, people can now live by. Now, these aren't exact promises. This doesn't mean it's going to happen every single time. It's kind of like the, these proverbs we tell one another. The early bird gets the warm, like get up early, get there first. Um, but is that always true? Um, not always, but it's usually the case. Or we might uh, say something like an apple a day keeps what? The doctor away. We might say something like that. Is that always true? No, but it's kind of the law of life and we share that and in proverbs there is these laws for life if you do a what happens is b and there are positives there are negatives there are consequences and laws of life and um, when we look at this it's uh, it's got all these wonderful promises and i just um in our passage today there's four promises or laws of life that will happen usually and it says this uh Verse 2, for example, for the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Isn't that a wonderful uh, way we want to live? Uh, another kind of a positive outcome of living committed to God is verse 4. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Um, living committed to God also leads, verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him. He will make, pa- make straight your paths. Um, and then... The last result of living committed to God, we see here in verse 8, it will be healing to your flesh, refreshment to your bones. Now, these are all wonderful things. If you would want to have a life that you could say, I could have a life like this. If for this upcoming year, uh, that the length of days, that they'll be filled with peace, that I would find favor, good success in the eyes of God and of man, that God will make straight the paths of my life, that I will have healing to my flesh, refreshment to my bones, Uh, wouldn't we all want that? And if we are a parent giving advice or asking for prayer, we would pray these things. I want this for my family. I want this for me. And today we see this, and we're going to look at these four. We're going to see how we ought to be committed to God and then the results of that. Uh, It's interesting, you know, this whole passage here, uh, is written in a form where it's like a, a father giving advice to a child. And that's the literary form that it uses. This is the third time um, in the book of Proverbs as we get to chapter 3. It starts in verse 1, to my son. And in verse 11, it ends kind of bookends that section 1 through 11. And there are six um, do's and you should now receive types of uh, teachings here. We're going to look at the first four in our text here, right? Um, I, I came across a list. I think it was, I always get them confused, Jimmy Fallon or one of the Jimmy guys that does the uh, late night shows, right? They had a list of uh, advice, funny words of advice that people have gotten from their dad and they shared some of these and I, I thought they were kind of clever. It might have been one of you or one of your dads that might have said, said this, but uh, I share a few of these uh, kind of funny ones. It says, uh, uh, one person came up and said, yeah, my dad said this, essential oils. The only essential oil is what is used to fry fries, onion rings, chicken wings. There is no other oil that is essential, right? Um, one parent said this to a child, uh, as you start your new job, don't talk too much this way they won't know how little you know, right? Isn't that kind of true? Um, one young lady came up and shared how when she was a little girl and starting her first day of softball and the ball was so hard and she was afraid of getting hit and she said, Dad, I'm afraid of getting hit and the dad patted her on the back, reassuring, said, um, it's okay, we have insurance, now go out there, right? And, uh, 
And one parent told their child, um, don't ever do drugs. You'll really like it, so don't ever do it, right? And there are some truths to that. And these are uh, fun words of advice, and maybe we have received words of advice from our parents, or maybe we as parents have given words of advice. When we get to Proverbs chapter 3, it is now God in the form of a parent, a father giving advice to the child, um, is mentioned in this way. These laws of life. If you do A, B will happen. If you do A, B will happen. B will be the consequence. And we see this here this morning. We're going to look at these four that I mentioned. That We read the four blessings, um, but it'll, now we'll see the four um, commitments. And I, I, my prayer for us, as we start this new year, uh, new school, or whatever it is, that we would be people committed to God. Um, the thing that really, as a Christian, that number one uh, prayer would be that prayer. That, dear son, that you would grow in God's blessing. My dear daughter, that you would grow in God's blessing. You would be committed to God. That you would do well in school. You would do well in life. You would do well socially. Uh, you would prosper at work and all of these things. But that you would, first and foremost, be committed to God. That you would not compromise who you are in Christ. So the first uh, commitment, he says, is to keep God's word. We see this in verse 1. Uh, we are supposed to be committed to God's word. Verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. This is God speaking to us. And here he uses uh, two different ways to describe kind of the same thing, I guess you could say. Do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commandments. One of it is more intellectual. Do not forget. Remember. Some of you are very good at memorizing or remembering. You can re memorize Bible verses. You can memorize people's names and places and so on. He says, remember, do it intellectually. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. But it also says, secondly, it speaks to the heart. Let your heart keep my commandments. Keep the commandments in your heart. To keep it is the idea of now living it out. So don't just know it in your head. Don't be so proud that you could memorize the books of the Bible or how many verses there are. But know and live out in your heart these words. So what we remember, there was a, um, a study that said, that summarized what we remember in this way. It says that uh, uh, ten, we remember 10% of the things that we read. So some of you last semester had a class and you read something for a quiz. You might have forgotten 90% of it by now. Uh, we remember 20% of the things that we hear. So the average person here will leave this place and remember maybe 20%, maybe a little bit more, right? Um, we remember 30% of the things that we see. So you watch a movie, you remember 30% of it. Here are the characters, this is the plot, and so on and so forth. But... What we see and hear, if we see it and hear it together, we remember 50%. If we discuss it with others, we remember 70%. If we experience it ourselves, we'll remember 80%. And if we teach it, we'll remember 95% of the content. And so we are a people called to now take in God's word. Intellectually, don't forget, but also to now keep the commandments in our hearts, to live by them. Um, the Bible speaks of the heart as the place where we now remember God, where we, it's the center of our lives, you know, Psalm 119, verse 69, um, with my whole heart I keep your precepts, Psalm 119, 145, I will, uh, with my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. So this picture of keeping God's word in our heart is mentioned all throughout the uh, Psalms here. Uh, in church history, uh, one of the church fathers, his name was Eusebius. Eusebius records when Constantine, the emperor, had become a Christian. And now the whole empire is going to now be a Christian state. And they would come and have worship service on the Lord's Day. But back in those days, um, they didn't have uh, the word of God in a written form. 
people didn't have access to the written word of God. And so what would happen is they would come to church, and as they would come and gather for worship, the people would gather, and because they don't know, the leader or the pastor or someone would come up and start, come up and start reading the word of God. And as he is reading, the people would stand in reverence and listen to the word of God. There are times, on average, that they would read for two hours straight, he records. And there was one instance, Eusebius records, where Constantine is fatigued and not feeling well. And as he is standing for the reading of God's word in the second hour, his servants say, shouldn't you sit? You look, you don't look well. And his response was, it is wickedness to give negligent ears when the word of God is being read. It is wickedness to give negligent years when the word of God is being read. We do this here on Sunday. We gather and we stand for the reading of God's word. It's my way of now showing respect. It's my way of saying I am standing to attention. It's my way of saying I am no longer distracted or divided. We do this when someone important comes in the room, usually in a courtroom when the the judge comes in and everyone is asked to stand. Kind of give your attention to what is going to be said and how important it is. It says here with God's word that we give our hearts, that we do not bring negligent years to hear the word, to read the word, to study the word. We have the word of God in front of us. And what happens? This is the blessing, verse 2. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Someone who lives by God's word will have more peace in their lives than someone who doesn't. Someone who embraces and cherishes God's word daily will live a life that feels longer, that feels fuller, and more peaceful in this way. And I want to ask you, how long do you spend in God's word? Do you bring a diligent, an open, a listening year and heart to God's Word. Uh, every morning we have access, you know, we have access to the Word of God and so many to listen do we go with years to hear, which is so important. Secondly, the second commandment, uh, command or commitment rather, is to have a, a, a steadfastness in faithfulness. Be steadfast in faithfulness. Faithfulness, it, it's, the, oh, it's a word used to describe relationship, isn't it? There's someone who is faithful. It, it's a picture of constant presence, someone who does not flake, someone who is not so up and down, someone who is faithful, someone who is always there. And you cannot call someone faithful who did not put in time, did not put in the years, you don't call someone a faithful spouse or a faithful friend out overnight. This is described as someone that spent years and decades. So be steadfast in faithfulness to God. You are in a relationship. This is a relationship word. Uh, look at verse 3 here. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So, verse 4, you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. There is the now... Uh, consequence of living in this relationship. Uh, going back to verse 3, these two are mentioned, right? Steadfast love and faithfulness. Don't let it forsake you. Don't, don't forget about it, is the idea. Don't leave home without it. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Those are the same two words described when God encounters Moses. And God describes his presence in a covenant language, and he describes himself to the people of God. He describes who he is to them, and he describes himself as having a steadfast love and faithfulness. You look at Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, God calls Moses, and he tells him to now uh, bring the tablets, and he was going to rewrite the law, the Ten Commandments, and he says to bring it here. And this is how he describes himself. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed before him. This is Moses. And proclaim the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So as the reader is reading Proverbs throughout the centuries in the church, 
they all of a sudden remember what happened in Exodus 34. God describes himself, it's interesting because he's saying, record the law, write the Ten Commandments down, take it to the people, they have to keep the Ten Commandments, but yet, as he is giving the law, he is describing himself as abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is a, a covenant word. This is something you share when you, in, you engage in this type of relationship. This is about being faithful to God. So when he says now, uh, back to Proverbs, verse 3, in the, let, steadfast, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Keep them. And he here uh, the writer talks about two physical places. He says, bound them, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. What does that mean? Bind them around your neck. This is a, a poetic language. The neck housed the throat, obviously. The neck represents life. And if something happened to your throat, or they get you, your enemy attacks you at the neck, you can die. It's where you have food, where you have air. It's the passage, the place of life. And in it now, it says to, to do this, uh, to bind God's love and faithfulness around your neck. The neck represented this. In Proverbs um, 1, 8, and 9, for example, verse 9, For they are a graceful garland for your head, a pendant for your neck, Verse, chapter 3, verse 22, uh, they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. So it's representing when every time in the Proverbs the neck is mentioned, it's talking about your life. Put a pendant around your life, uh, adornment for your life. Live a beautiful life. Your life is beautiful not because you wear physical jewelry. Your life is not beautiful because you have beautiful hair or beautiful clothes. Your life is adorned and beautiful now because you are in a relationship with God. You are a person who lives by faith. And there is something so appealing to this. You know, in, in uh, antiquity, the in military custom, when they would go to war and now the general or the, the, the victor of the winning side in a symbolic gesture would often step on the neck of the enemy. And they would keep their foot on their neck. And it was a picture of victory that now I have conquered them on their neck. This was their life. Even in the New Testament, Romans 16, 4, Paul describes the sacrifice of Aquila and Priscilla. And he says that they laid down their own necks. They gave up their lives. They were willing to sacrifice their own necks for me. And so we now bind God's faithfulness. My life is defined by God's faithfulness, this steadfast love. I am a, a follower of Christ. And he also says to write them on the tablet of your heart. It's interesting, again, because when we go back to Moses' encounter, what does he tell him? He says to bring the tablet. You remember when he first was given the Ten Commandments, he goes and he breaks it after seeing now the idol worship. They had broken the law before they even had received it. And when he comes back, God says, here's the covenant. And he says, write it down again. A tablet, the King James calls it tables. It's like a tray, whether it was wood or stone, and it was something permanent. And the Ten Commandments, you know, you had ten on this side and ten, and it was a photocopy of the other, we can say. It was a covenant that the people would keep, and then now they would keep in the Ark of the Covenant, and it was one that it was my copy and your copy. And here he says to write it on your hearts, the tablet of your hearts. Jerry Bridges says that the heart is the first thing that wanders from God, and it is also the first thing that returns to God. The heart is the center of who you are. It is the center of why you do what you do. It is where you decide on all the things that you will do. And it is in the heart, he says, to write down this. Like the tablet of your heart. It is like a, something permanent. It is like getting a tattoo on your heart. And it's a reminder of the relationship I have with God. I am a child of God. I am a follower of Christ. 
And this is my first and foremost identity. You are a Christian. And as you go back to school and as you go back to work and all of these things as the fall now and the summer has ended and the fall is here, remember you are a Christian. And it will be easy to compromise. It will be easy. It might even look more fun to go and be in this group and talk in certain ways. Have you ever been around some people that talk a certain way at church and then outside you see them in a different setting and it shocks your ears. I can't believe they talk like that. I can't believe they act like that. Let me encourage you to be courageous, to be stronger than the average person. Have a commitment and remember daily who you are. Be faithful. The third command that's given with this uh, positive consequence is to trust in the Lord. We see in verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. This is a verse that many of us know very well. We love this verse. Why? Because it tells us to trust, lead not in your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. But the older we get, isn't it harder to trust? Maybe we have scars that tell us, I cannot trust. I've been lied to. I've been forgotten or forsaken. How can I trust? And he tells us to trust God in this way. Let me encourage us. Let me encourage you to trust in the Lord. In our text today, in verse 5, it tells us in the capital, L-O-R-D, trust in the Lord. This is his proper name. It's a reminder. Don't just trust in a, a, a deity or a force or an energy or heaven or, or something in gen, gen, uh, that's generic in general. Trust in the Lord. Trust in your Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we. And I love the contrast, but we. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. They look for things that are tangible, power. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We are different. We trust in something that is invisible. We trust in someone that we cannot touch or see, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Some will trust in chariots and horses. And they feel secure. They feel their power from that. Trust is hard to do. You know, in our uh, society today, everything is so quick. Uh, we want people to reply right away. We, we want our phones to work right away. We want to be able to upload things at a higher speed. We want things to happen quickly. And when things don't happen as quickly, we oftentimes think, Maybe they didn't hear me. Maybe they didn't see me. There's a book uh, by uh, Kazuki Kuyama, a Japanese theologian. And the name of the book sums it up so well, The Three Mile an Hour God. What a title. The Three Mile an Hour God. Three miles an hour is the pace of how an average person walks. And it is the picture of Jesus walking constantly with his disciples. It's the picture of God who takes time to answer in his perfect timing. And sometimes we think, I prayed for this last week. And maybe some of you were here, maybe some of you logged on last week, and you had a prayer request and nothing has changed within a week. And already you're saying, can I trust you? My heart wants to go to the chariots and the horses and find some answers. God, can I trust you? And he says, yeah. Three miles an hour is okay. Koyama says in that book, God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It is an inner speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. And he says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. He will get you from point A to point B. He will get you to where you need to be. Uh, I love this because this is uh, the language that's used by Isaiah the prophet when he describes now how someone will come and they will make straight a path, a prepare a road. And this was a prophecy of who John the Baptist was going to be for Jesus as a forerunner uh, for the Messiah. 
Proverb, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 4, every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. God will now make this happen. So when you think of the complexity of your lives, when you think of the hardships of your life, somehow God will get you over it, through it, under it. Um, if you've been on a road that is treacherous, if you've been driving through the mountain, you remember seeing uh, uh, tunnels or valleys and there are bridges and you say wow somehow someone has made this road so well one of the uh shows that i you know you get on youtube and it's a rabbit hole just keeps going and one of them i was into for a while was a channel called uh, the world's most dangerous roads i know some of you have probably seen it right some of our dear sisters are going why would you watch that right but some of the brothers are like why wouldn't you watch that right um Here's a picture of one of the scenes, right? Look at that road, right? I think this is somewhere in Pakistan or whatnot. Um, and it's all these truck drivers just barely getting by. And you're like, oh my gosh, are they going to fall? Is that little goat going to fall off? Is that cow going to fall off? Do they know where they're going? Is that car going to make it? Um, and it's a, a... But somehow, the picture we get is God making straight our paths. He will get you to where he wants you to go to. And so put your trust in him. And lastly, it's to fear the Lord. Verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh, verse 8, and refreshment to your bones. Wise in your own eyes. This is the person who, do not, who does not listen to outsiders. This is the person who says, I live by my own creed. Think of yourself five years ago. Think of yourself seven years ago. Think of yourself ten years ago. Some of you older, think of yourself when you were 25 years old. And you say, oh my gosh, I was so young. You know, you look at old pictures, you say, oh my gosh, look at the things that I wore. Why did I do my hair like this? Why did I think I was so cool back then? I, knew, I thought I knew so much. And if I could go back, I would tell myself, don't do your hair like that. Don't wear those clothes. To be wise in your own eyes is to say, God, I'm smarter than you. In our culture today, we are so big, and I hear this often. On, on, um, there's people talking about, oh, what, what, is your, what is your truth? And we really have to define uh, phrases like that carefully. What is your truth? This is my truth. This is who I am. This is someone that says, I'm wise in my own eyes. This is who I am. And what counts is not the validity of the truth, but the, the amount of belief I have in it. And as long as I'm sincere about it, boy, all of a sudden that becomes now the truth. But what's more important than my own truth is the truth of God. What God wants, what God's will is, what God's word says, what matters is my will now bows down to God's desires. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Don't fear what others think. Don't be concerned just about yourself. Fear the Lord. And here is now the consequence of that. It will be, verse 8, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Flesh is also, can be translated, is, means navel. It's a picture of a baby attached by the umbilical cord to the mother. It will be healing to your flesh or, or nourishment to your flesh. This is the only source of nourishment that a baby would get before he or she's born. Refreshment to your bones. Some translate that as medicine to your bones. The strength of the bone. How it's filled with marrow. Is it young? Is it strong? It determines now how strong a person is. As the bone becomes older or dried or brittle, and then eventually, even in the, in the Bible, in Ezekiel 37, there's a vision of the valley of dry bones. There's no longer life. It's the form of life, but there isn't. And it comes back to life by the Spirit of God. The bones represents now the 
the inner life of a person, that more than just the physical health, the life of the person. Uh, Proverbs 12 talks about the rottenness to the bones in the depths of the person, how hard it, this really is. Uh, Proverbs 16.24 talks about healing to the bones. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. If we fear God, if I say, God, I care more about what you say, and I care more about what you think, even though how I feel sometimes goes contrary to what I read about your words and what you say to me, I have to now, I have to now bow down and I have to now follow you. And somehow that leads to a life that we find nourishment and medicine for who we are. We become stronger in life. We live better and our lives are better. And so this upcoming year, as we think about the things ahead of us, it's not so much about go and discover yourself and find yourself, but it is about go and fear the Lord. Go and take Him very seriously. Take Him more seriously this year than you did last year, than you did five years ago. And say, God, what do you want me to do? And we will see the consequences of that. Healing to your flesh. Refreshment to your bones. Our lives will be increased and improved in this way. And this is my prayer for us today. And uh, Let's bow our heads together. Um, we'll pray. And we'll take communion. We thank you, Lord, that you are here for us. Lord, we confess we take our commitment to you sometimes too loosely or lightly. We're reminded today from Proverbs 3 to trust in you, to fear you. Lord, to write your words on our hearts, bind them on our necks. We see how serious this is, and so, God, uh, we thank you. Today, Lord, as we worship, as we take communion, would you bless us here? Um, would you remind us of your love in Christ here? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.